Well, good morning, church. It is awesome to be back. Amen. And we also do want to recognize uh, it is great to have Eric and Jacqueline's son Terrence here with him. Amen. Amen. And he brought a friend with him today at church. It's great to have you here as well. Awesome. All right. Well, let's get on into God's Word. Well, if you pull out your bulletin, uh, today we're going to be starting a series. Um, we're going to be here, Tracy and I will be here another six weeks. And so we're going to spend those last weeks uh, studying my favorite book in the Bible, the book of James. And, uh, and so the bulletin here has a little short intro here, but uh, we've got all the scriptures about testing our faith. All the scriptures where Jesus actually draws from the Sermon on the Mount from Jesus' lesson. Uh, and then in one of the next bulletins, we will cover all of the references to nature in the book of James, which is very powerful. Uh, you know, it's great to be back from L.A. Um, we got my mother moved successfully. She's living with the Onikeas. They have a great place there in Los Angeles. And uh, had a great time unsuccessfully looking for a home for us. So, uh, amen. It, it was so cool, though. We got there Saturday night. And uh, there was no hotels available. Uh, we needed to have a, a room for Sunday and Monday. And uh, because uh, it's by the beach, kind of close to the beach, the hotels just fill up on Saturdays. And there was no place for us to stay. So uh, we stopped in Riverside, California to drop my mom's trailer off. And my dad let us stay there with him, which was really awesome. And awkward. So, amen. <laughs> For those of you who had broken homes, you know, you have your mom and your dad, and when they're in the same house, uh, after breaking up, it's awkward. So. But, uh, but it was pretty cool, because you're disciples, and so you just uh, obey the scriptures, and awkwardness doesn't really matter. So, <laughs> Amen. But uh, it was so funny. We got there. I went to Sunday service. And uh, it, it just kind of took me back. It was hilarious. The guy went up to do the welcome, and that was great. And then the brother gets up to do the announcements. And he goes, all right, I got some announcements for us. And, and uh, I felt very at home because this sister goes, announce it, bro. <laughs> it's very, very awesome. So uh, I thought Lindsay had followed me there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we had some very exciting things happen while, uh, while I was gone. Uh, we had an exciting, very exciting change of plans for us in our move and, uh, and uh, what we do when we get there um, and involving Jesse and Lindsay. Where's Jesse at? All right. Je serving always. All right. But uh, the very exciting thing is that Jesse and Lindsay, uh, now I'm not personally excited as a person, but um, they're not going to be moving with us um, to the South Central region there in Los Angeles. They're actually going to be moving to the West region to be with Andrew and Patrick. Uh, because Andrew and Patrick have asked them to go to Africa with them, and Jesse and Lindsay have decided they're going to go there and train to go to Africa. So, um, the other very exciting thing is that um, as of two days ago, um, LA has officially offered Lindsay a position as the kingdom's first attorney. So, that's really awesome. So, they'll be able to have their baby. And uh, she'll be able to stay at home working, uh, you know, working full time for the church, but work from home and, ha and be able to take care of her babies. So that's really awesome. Amen. And if you don't know, Lindsay did so well in school that uh, because she's working for a nonprofit corporation, that makes it so that they pay her student loans. Georgetown covers it for free. So that's really incredible. So, amen. Awesome. Well, let's jump on into the book of James here. Now, the book of James was written uh, around 44 to 49 AD. And uh, James had a nickname. You know, we come up with these nicknames for each other. And uh, James' nickname was James the Just. So you always knew when you went to James, he's going to just tell it straight to you. You know what I mean? And uh, he had a very deep devotion to righteousness. And, uh, and as we all know, James, of course, was the brother of Jesus. And, uh, you know, but having, being straight up has its consequences at times. Uh, and the response was a lot of persecution toward him, personally. Uh, he was the leader of the Jerusalem church. We, we find that for sure uh, in Acts chapter 15, as he asserts to the Sadducees. Now, you've got to understand, the Sadducees was the, uh, was the body of elders. 
within the church. So the body of the elders of Israel. And they had just had, through Jesus, the final authority in making decisions transfer back away from them to Jesus. And when you're used to having authority, that, that, that can just make some people angry. Because we like to have influence, don't we? We like to be heard. We like to have our voice heard. And so um, their response to that uh, was to kill James. And so we know James was martyred right there at the temple. Uh, this book is incredible. There are 40 references to the Old Testament in this book. There are 20 individual references in five chapters to the Sermon on the Mount. And then there are 30 references to nature. Because to know God is to really understand nature and his power. James makes a very strong calling to the disciples to righteousness. And again, if you see the bulletin, the title, uh, the title I've given this series is The Righteous Life That God Desires. He was also calling out the persecution of the Jews, uh, the Pharisees who were angry about their authority being removed, that feeling that their voice wasn't heard anymore. And so he was challenging that in this book. And, and there's a very practical application to the scriptures here. James doesn't go into a ton of deep teaching. He just straight says, obey the word of God. Amen? Yes. Let's begin with James, chapter 1, verse 1. Right. My prayer for you today is that you will see your opportunities to display your maturity and your righteousness. The title of today's lesson is Seeing the Opportunities for Righteousness. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. To the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. You know, uh, he begins right here. And we come to find he's writing very specifically. Of course, he's writing to all of us. as The scriptures were preserved for us to be able to read. However, there's a heavy focus in this written to the tribes of Israel. Because there was a growing sense in God's movement in the first century that those who were Jews were just a little bit better than everybody else. There was a sense of entitlement that had grown. And so he's writing very specifically to the 12 tribes that are now scattered, representing that God had scattered them and extended himself to the whole world, not just the Israelites. Amen? Yeah. But I want to present a concept here of the opportunities. Today in the scriptures, you're going to see many opportunities for you to display righteousness. And uh, one of the things about the books of James is it's very convicting. Yeah. So I, I'm not going to try and be all hard line. I don't need to be. James does all that for me in the book, you know. But how horrible if we go through the life of being a disciple of Jesus and consistently have these opportunities to display righteousness and yet we choose unrighteousness instead. That would mean that we really missed having the gratitude for the salvation that God gave us. We, we, we miss the love for us that God has individually. It's so easy for us to forget God's plan for us and how much he loves us and is considering us when he allows things to happen or makes them happen. But how horrible if we, if we don't choose to lay our lives down for one another, especially, and for a lost world. It means we really miss the boat. But, of course, our worst day in the kingdom of God is far better than the best day in the world. Let me tell you, the worst day you have as a Christian is far better than being lost, having no self-control, being disconnected from the love of God, and, of course, we get disconnected from those who we want to be connected with most when we're in the world. Our first point, therefore, James chapter, two, chapter 1, verse 2, is don't let it go over your head. James chapter 2, chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Doesn't that just go over our head a lot? Have you ever had somebody tell you a joke and they're just anticipating you're just going to be on the floor rolling and you're like, huh? Don't the scriptures do that to us though? Somebody will read us a scripture just anticipating it's going to change our heart and we're just going to soften up and become more loving and you're like, what 
What in the world are you talking about? Don't you know what happened to me? And it just goes whew, right over our head. He goes on here, he says, that you are supposed to consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Why? Because, he says, you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. You love perseverance, right? You love it so much you do it all the time. But it's interesting what he says about perseverance and, and how important perseverance is for our lives. He says perseverance must finish its work. Oh, we know perseverance is a lot of work, don't we? But often we don't finish the work of perseverance. Many times we white knuckle it. You know what I'm talking about? This is Chocolate City, so we don't white knuckle it. <laughs> See, I'm half white, so I get, I get the white knuckle still. But we just grind through with a bad attitude, which is not what the scriptures teach us. See, to finish the work is to go from that bad attitude to a complete soft heart where we are submitting and we're pushing through understanding God has a better plan than the one we had for us. It says, perseverance must finish its work. Why? So that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That's pretty awesome. You go, I don't know about that person. No, but that's not the awesome part. The awesome part is being mature and complete and not lacking anything. See, we want that, but we don't want to finish the work to get there. And it shows our immaturity spiritually when we do that. Now, he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, I think he's being a little facetious here. Because I, I, if I said, do you, who has all wisdom in the room? Nobody would raise their hand, right? So we all lack wisdom. We're all in that place. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God. And yet so often, don't we ask each other instead of God? He says, if any of you lack wisdom, he should ask God, who gives what? Generously to all without finding fault. See, we all have sin, right? God has many reasons to hold things against us, hold back on us. But he doesn't find fault with our sin. He still gives us wisdom generously if we ask. See, you don't have to ever say, well, I don't really know what to do. You just need to ask for the wisdom. Now, here's the catch. You may not get it when you want it, right? So if you don't get it when you want it, that's where we get the bad attitude, right? But he says here, but when he asks, see, there's conditions to get wisdom from God. That when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. When's the last time you prayed a prayer and you didn't really think it was going to happen? You, you, you just, okay, I'm going to pray for it because I know I need to, but I don't know. And you can always tell when you're in that place because you're like, well, if it happens. But see, if we want wisdom from God, we have to ask God for these things without doubting. Says the man, but when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave. See, here's what, here comes the first reference to nature. He who doubts is like a wave of the sea tossed back and forth. Wow. Says that man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. Seems pretty stiff, huh? And, Yet, this is why. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. You know, God has a plan for your life. You know, we like the Jeremiah 29, 11 scripture that says there are plans to prosper us and not to harm us. But then we forget about it and we blame and we get angry when we think God is harming us with trials. And, that, and it steals our joy. And yet, right here, I have a question for you. Your trials that you've experienced lately. I'm not even going to say if, because we all have them, right? Anybody not have any trials lately? Raise your hand. It's pretty amazing, huh? Black, white, rich, poor, we all got trials. But do you really understand what they're for? You think God's just 
out to get you, push you down like the rest of the world? See, the question though is, does God expect you to completely obey in the middle of all these trials? Every scripture in the Bible. That's the real question. That's a pretty high expectation. Are you going to meet it? No, neither am I. I'm going to share about mine in just a minute. But, but he absolutely expects that we will be completely obedient in the middle of the trials that he either creates or allows. Yet we have distrust in him. We typically call it distrust in man, but it's really a distrust in God. And, you know, the, the, the reference here to the waves is a very powerful one. Because our emotions are like these waves. And yet that's not really what it represents. The waves really represent the power of the Holy Spirit. See, have you ever stood in the ocean and tried to stop a wave? It doesn't work too well, does it? But see, when we fight God... God does with us what that wave does, whatever it wants. When it wants, how it wants, however it wants to do it. And yet, we go, well, I stood there and it didn't move me. Yeah, but the rest of it went right on by you and you missed it. Because you didn't go with it. You didn't go with God's plan. And yet our emotions, we think, are the waves because they're so powerful, aren't they? They're like these big waves. You ever see Harry Potter, that girl? <laughs> That's like us. We can't even scream. We get so emotional. And yet, sometimes the, things that, sometimes the wave that comes in your life is a very disappointing wave. It's a very disappointing wave to find out Jesse and Lindsay are moving with us but not going to be with us disappointing wave. But I'm fired up for them, man. I'm fired up for Africa. I'm fired up for the movement to have an attorney. I mean, that is flat cranky. Sometimes the waves are very hurtful, we think. See, the things that are hurtful are actually hurtful because you're already hurt. Just the thing that happened put you in touch with it. Sometimes, you know, I'm going to L.A., we're, going, we're like the surfers. We see that wave, and we're like, yeah, I'm riding this, baby. Woo! We get all arrogant. And then what happens? The wave. <laughs> you've, seen the, you've seen videos of surfers. Double-minded. Unstable in all we do when we won't ask God. He goes on here, and he says in verse, in verse 9, the brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. But the one who is rich should take pride in his low position. See, so often, as people who are more rich than the rest of the world, and I have a video that we're going to watch. I'm not sure if I'm going to do it Wednesday or next Sunday uh, from the missionary journeys in Haiti in the last couple of weeks. And, and just what poor really is. And yet, we're so riding the wave, wanting to be heard, wanting, our, wanting things to go our way. And we're, ready to, and we're getting ready to crash. But he says here, you should take pride in the low position because you'll pass away like a wildfire flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossoms fall and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. But blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Turn to, hold your place there and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. See, God brings us low by taking things away from us. Our riches the people we trust in, the things that we trust in. And we've got to, he does that to teach us to trust him. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, it says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not us. We are hard-pressed 
on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. You know, uh, this is the attitude of somebody focused on God, leaning on God, inquiring of God for wisdom. And yet so often we don't go to God for the strength that we need. He says in verse 16, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. Yet inwardly we're what? Being renewed day by day. You know, the Bible calls all these things light and momentary troubles. And you've got to really just ask yourself, the trials you've been going through, are they light and momentary troubles? Or have they stopped you in your tracks? Are they bigger than your God in your mind right now? Because if they're bigger than your God, your attitude will change drastically. See, what God's going for is eternal glory. What he's going for is a new you that you can't even imagine yet. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter 1. In verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth. Is that not awesome? I'm so, you know what? I am so proud of the church. In the middle of all this transition. You know, about six weeks ago, I started preaching on something I haven't preached on since I've been here in D.C. Evangelism. The whole time I've been here, I've never preached on evangelism. And yet six weeks ago, I did some lessons about our mission and our purpose and getting back to that purpose of being like God and the mission of saving this world. And yet I'm so proud of the way that everyone responded. I mean, immediately, there began to be a surge in people studying the Bible. And I, you know, I'm so proud to say, as of today, in the last five weeks, we'll have had six people baptized in the Lord. Is that not incredible? And certainly, we went through a time of pruning. I think we, we lost about 12 people in the church. Things, were, things got really tough at the beginning of the year. And, and yet, of course, God prunes. Why? To make us even more fruitful, which is what we're in the middle of now. And I'm so proud that that is the stance that you've all taken. Amen? Amen. But he says right here, a new birth. You know, today we're going to see two new births. Amen. It's going to be incredible. But I hope you remember yours. And I hope you're grateful for yours. But I want to talk about not just the new birth of baptism. Because I think one of the more understood concepts in the scriptures is this new birth that comes from trials. He says here, he's given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ, Jesus Christ from the dead. And an inheritance, check this out, that can never perish, right? Spoil or fade and kept for you in heaven. That means it lasts forever. Is that not awesome? See, but it's not for everybody. It's for those who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, see, we just read about in James about our trials and considering it pure joy. But this is the practical instruction on how to have that joy. He says, in this you greatly rejoice. See, the way you rejoice through trials is remembering you're not lost. It's remembering you resurrected from the dead. And yet it doesn't just happen at baptism. It says, in this you greatly rejoice now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Now he tells you why they're coming. What trial are you going through right now? Because he's about to tell you why you have this trial. See, you're maybe focused on who he let the trial come through. Who said what? Who did what? Who didn't do something? And yet he says, verse 7, These have come so that your faith, of, which is of greater worth than gold, and here it comes, which perishes. 
even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine, may result in glory and honor and praise when Jesus Christ is revealed in your life. See, when we give in to the bad attitudes, when we get entitled, Jesus just kind of slips from the forefront of our life somewhere. And he has to be revealed again. When you've allowed that to happen, your faith has died. Not gotten bad, it's died. And I think it's what, this is the most misunderstood concept, I believe, is that to get to heaven, our faith is going to have to die. Which means there's going to have to be things that happen to you that kill your faith. You go, hmm. It gets really quiet. Because you're wrestling right now. God, people. It's so easy to focus on people. It's so easy to choose anger. It's so easy to choose bitterness. It's so easy to drive your spiritual car looking in the mirror, looking behind you, all that happened. I'll make sure that doesn't happen again. It's what we do. And yet we forget God values you more than anything he created. And yet you're not a diamond. You're not platinum. You're not gold. Your faith is worth more than gold, but you're not gold yet. That's why he's got to polish you up. That's why he's got to put you in the crucibles and burn the impurities off of your faith. It says, verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Wow. You should have been a whole lot more fired up about that. You're a little dull this morning. And you were, if you're saying, you should almost be jumping out of the seats, man. So playoffs, you're jumping out of your seats in front of the TV, right? Think about it. The test is because you're a diamond in the rough being made. And just like that coal, God's squeezing you, just, turn, just churning it and molding you. But you can choose to not let him. All you have to do is take those fruits of the spirit that he just placed inside you and just throw them out. And now he can't mold you. Now you're coal. Now you just get burned with the barbecue. That's all that happens. Secondly, let's go back to James 1. See, our pattern is we get depressed, we get hurt, so we stop denying ourselves. We stop living the life that Jesus called us to live when God's goal is maturity, completeness, perfection, blessed, and a crown of life. Don't miss the boat. Pass the test this morning. Get happy about being rich with salvation. And blow through these trials like they are momentary troubles. James 1 verse 13. Our second point, the accusation blame game. It is a game we have all played, and it is a game with the Lord. James 1 verse 13, he says... When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. You go, well, I don't say that. No, you don't say it, but you mean it. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. See, sometimes you think God's playing with you. He's not playing a game. He's very serious about you being with him in heaven. It's not a game to him. So he's not playing with you. He's not messing with you. He's shaping you to be who he planned for you to be, which is far better than you could ever imagine you'll be. It says, but each one is tempted, right? Now check this out. What's living inside you this morning? Because when you're tempted, see, that would come from Satan and people who Satan uses. But each one is tempted when by whose desire? All right, everybody point at yourself. My desire. See, it's your desire. See, when you're on evil desire, you're dragged away and enticed. 
Then after desire has conceived, see, after you get it out there in the light, get open with what's really in there, it gives birth to sin. Because then you get challenged on it and you don't like that in that moment. And sin, when it's full grown. See, you don't want to go there. Let me tell you what, you do not want, some of you just, you got your sin, you remember Carlos, before he left, you take care of your sin, you pat it, I can't do it like him, but you love your sin, so you don't change it. You're, you're, you're nurturing it, you're letting it grow up. When it's full grown, you're dead. See, when sin is full grown, that's the spiritual death. That's the apostasy Hebrews 6 talks about. It says, don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift. Hmm. That's a new way to look at a trial. Good and perfect gift from above. I don't like this. Thank you, God, for this incredible gift. What an opportunity of righteousness I have before me. Don't be deceived. See, call it what it really is. To God, it's a gift. I mean, if you're about to be made into gold, is that not a gift? If you're about to be polished and shiny, isn't that a gift? You know, the streets of heaven are paved with gold that's what? Like pure glass, the Bible says. So he's trying to polish you up so you're representative. You ever come into a party dressed the wrong way? I know Patty has. I saw it once. No, I'm just kidding. But, you know, guess what? There's nobody dressed wrong in heaven. Because everybody in heaven's let themselves be polished and trained and molded. They come up just as shiny as that glass because they've allowed God to lead their life. Don't be deceived. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through what? The Word of God. That we might be a kind of first fruits of all He created. Wow. Wow. So God allows these trials so he can stand so proud as a father as you overcome them and are molded into a fashion that you can be used the way he intends to use you. What is the evil desire living inside of you that you mistreat so many people about? See, these are a trap for your soul from Satan. Comfort, justice, fairness, no one hurt me. Desire for a great family, financial security. I just want to be self-supporting so I can work for the Lord. That's one of the biggest pieces of garbage. You, you, like, you like money. And you want to be secure and be able to do the Lord's work. But you want to be secure before you do it. Try doing both because he gives you the ability to. Eric, look at Eric Chapman, man. Okay, I mean, what a great example for our church. Gets up at 4 in the morning, 3 in the morning, takes a train ride up to work, comes and puts up with all our nonsense. Yeah. Notice I didn't say yours. <laughs> puts up with all of our nonsense, counsels us, trains us, teaches us. He's not paid by the church. He's not going, oh, I'm just going to try and be independently wealthy so that I can just, you know, live, up, live fat on the hog and... And then I can do the... No, he's dug in doing the work. Jacqueline's dug in doing the work, guys. We, we, we've got to look at those leaders who are in our lives and imitate their faith. God is tempting me. How, how often have you accused the Lord of tempting you? <laughs> See, we play the accusation game. That's all the blame is. You blame somebody, you're, you're just accusing them. I want to look at some of the practical ways we, we say God is tempting us. Because uh, we, we don't actually say that. We don't have the gall to say, God, why are you tempting me? Maybe some of us do, but those ones are like struck down real fast. You know what? I just need a new job. The one you have isn't good enough? My boss. Really, you're saying God is tempting you. Because you know he put that boss in your life. You know what, I think maybe I married the wrong person. You're saying God is tempted. You're saying that the perfect person that God put in your life, God made a mistake, and he's tempting you with it. 
My kids are out of control. This is one of the biggest ones, man. They just won't obey me because they are you. <laughs> there it is. I saw Jacqueline look at Terrence. <laughs> You know, so, some people come and they say, I shouldn't really be leading. I know I have a position. I know you put, and this is how it goes. You made me a leader, and I just can't handle it. Like, don't you realize if I made you a leader, God let that happen? So which means that's him. Otherwise, he would have blocked me from making that choice. Now, maybe it was a mistake, and he'll show all of us that, but he let it happen. Because yes, men make mistakes, and then God works through their mistakes. But we don't like when somebody make, we don't like somebody make, make a mistake with somebody else, right? Yeah. See, we don't want the immature leader. Does he have to? Do I have? Does, do I have to be his training? <laughs> Nobody wants to be the leader's training, but everyone wants everybody trained. So who's going to be the one in the middle of the training? I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm talking to you, but that's all right. There's like 20 of you that I'm talking to you right now. No, I'm just kidding. But here's the one, though. I was sinned against. You're saying God is tempting you. When you're so bold about that you were so sinned against, I mean, I know we have Matthew 18, but Matthew 18 is there for our lack of faith. It, it's really there accommodating us. Just like marriage. Paul says it's better to be single, but he accommodates us, so go ahead and get married because you so lack self-control. See, God's a good God. He accommodates us for where he knows we lack in our nature. And so, when we're blaming God in this way, well, he said this, she said that, that's why I'm mad. You know, you had evil desire already. And it just brought that anger out of you already. You can't play the accusation, blame game, and get the perfect gift that God's trying to give you. See, you cannot blame your way through the trials. You cannot accuse your way through the trials. You, you've got to go with God's plan and learn what he's teaching you so that you get the gift from him. Amen? Because that's the goal. Why? You're a first fruit. Is that what's up there now? You're a first fruit. What is a first fruit? The best of something you own. See, we get a little quiet when God talks about giving our first fruit, right? I love James did an analogy once. He put 10 oranges up there. Y'all remember that? He said, all right, that one's mine. Fine. He got down to the last one, the one-tenth. Cut it in half. Oh, that one was God's. We tend to not honor first fruits. And yet, God honors the first fruit. He loves when your heart is to give Him your best. Something you offer in sacrifice that is your best. And yet, God is giving you these perfect gifts from above. These incredible trials. You know why? Because you are literally his best. Come on. It says these trials, in these trials, you got to understand, you are a kind of first fruit, the Bible says. You are the best of God. And he's prepping you and molding you because he's sacrificing your life so others can come to know him too. The same way he did Jesus. Don't play the blame game. Don't play the accusation game. Because when you play the blame game, it is a game. It's like Monopoly. You go directly to jail. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. No perfect gift from above for you. Don't miss the opportunity to take ownership of your heart and your life. Thirdly, James, 19, James 1 verse 19. The opportunity of God-centered communication. My dear brothers, I guess I should say sisters too right here, right? Take note of this. Who's got your pen? Your little typing on your text? Yeah, take note of this. Everyone, 
Say it with me. Everyone should be quick to listen. Woo! Woo! That's hard to say, huh? <laughs> quick to listen. Wow. And slow to speak. And slow to become angry. See, you're supposed to be slow as a disciple. For man's anger, this is, and this is the scripture that our, that our theme scripture for the series, does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. There is a life that God desires from you that is righteous and pure, and he's, he's teaching you to be that. He's molding you into be that. He's molding you to not fight so much and argue so much and be angry so much and think so negatively. He's molding you to impact this world for eternity. He says, therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so, pre so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen. So it doesn't just being talked about being quick to listen. Do not merely listen to the word. And so deceive yourselves. Wow. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the words, not do what it says, is like a man that looks his face in the mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. The older we get, the more we want to do that. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Wow. Is that not an awesome scripture? James is so awesome. <laughs> I love this guy. He's literally saying, shut it. I mean, this is some of the best practical instruction in the scriptures, if you really think about it. What activities do we do most in our life? Think and talk. The only other scriptures that make more of an impact in our life are the scriptures about our thoughts, because a lot, so much of what we say is from that. Think about this. I mean, how practical is it? Well, when's the last time you went an entire day and didn't even have a single conversation with anybody? That's how practical it is. This is a scripture that we probably use hourly, at least. So this would be pretty important to understand something you use just about every hour or so, huh? He says, be quick to listen. Announce it, bro. <laughs> uh, what was that you said again? You know, it makes life miserable. Wastes tons of hours of time. And makes unnecessary conversations when we don't listen. Then he says, slow to speak. You know how we want to just tell the world how we feel, huh? If, if you don't believe that we want to tell the world how we feel, go look on your friend's Facebook post for about 30 seconds. Look on Twitter, Instagram, Foursquare. Even worse is Yelp, because you're yelping about everything you don't feel good about. That's the, that's the venting site. And when, you know, I think we forget, when we're in an argument, when you're arguing, you're really not communicating. At least it's not God-centered communication. Hold your place and go to Ephesians 4. We all know this scripture. We all love this scripture, right? Yeah, of you know, I had somebody tell me they felt convicted by some particular scriptures they were reading. And yet, there was a kind of a being down in a depression. And I was like, do you know what convicted means? It comes from the word conviction. So if you're gaining a deep conviction, that was what it means to be convicted. Isn't that awesome? So why would you feel down? And, and yet so often we read these scriptures and 
our response is to get down because we're really not convicted even though we say that. We say the word because it's like fellowship, it's like awesome, hey bro, you know. Our kingdom lingo becomes just meaningless words. And, and yet, I hope you are convicted today. I hope the scriptures convict you so that you'll have a deep conviction about godly communication, about the opportunities God gives you so that you can get these perfect gifts from it. And yet, right here, I really learned something when I did this particular study uh, this time around. As I went through it again, I, I grasped a new insight that I really didn't get before. I always thought, he said, be quick to listen. And then he said, be slow to speak. I thought he was just repeating himself, really. I didn't really realize it was different instruction. See, because he goes in, as he goes further through the passage, to explain that we're supposed to be focused on God's word and not forget and I didn't really realize that the slow to speak really had a lot to do with meditation on God's word. And, and looking intently into God's word. As we're, as we're listening, we're thinking about God's word and we're meditating on the scriptures that go along with that. That's why we're not talking in that moment. We're slow to speak because we're considering God's word. Not forgetting what we're supposed to look like. And yet, you really think about it, there's separate instruction. Slow, be quick to listen. How often do you already have your statements prepared? While, some, while somebody's talking, you're preparing your statements because you're not what? Listening. And, and so, but then when, when you are slow to speak, what would you be doing when you're being slow to speak and you're listening? You're considering. You're sympathizing. You're empathizing. You're meditating on the scriptures. That's slow to speak. See, that allows you to ask clarifying questions, not just throw your opinion back in someone's face right away. It allows you to say, is this what I hear you sing? Do I understand you correctly? It allows you to understand that God's got a better way in this conversation than just going back and forth. I am. I mean, you think about it. Actually, the Lord is. But. See, what that does, what obeying the scripture does, is it moves us toward critical thinking and consideration of others, considering them better than us, since that's how we're supposed to take every conversation. When's the last time you got in a conversation and if you really look back on it, you were better than everybody else? When you want your opinion heard, you are better than everybody. Everybody better listen to me because I know what's up right now. No perfect gift for you when you're in that place. Here's the cool news. You can be in a different place starting right now. I mean, you really think about it. What a better way than our way? We all have our varying degrees of how we handle things, right? Isn't this a much better way than the way we've chosen in our nature? And then he says, be slow to become angry. Because anger doesn't bring about the righteous life to the odd sires. Now, of course, he gives us room, right, in Ephesians, when he talks about don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. I always love that one. Get with somebody, they're all angry, right? And you go, all right, well, you got to tell you go to bed tonight. Good luck with that. <laughs> Call to obedience. Go to Mark chapter 7. Start bringing it to a close here. It's good to be back home. Mark 7 verse 14. Slow to become angry. I want to talk about that for a second. You know the easiest thing to do is get angry. <laughs> it takes no effort because it's who you are already. It's who I am already. Because we want justice, and yet justice is our own personal perspective. In Mark 7, verse 14, what's happened to you lately? 
Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean. Yet when you blame, that's exactly what you're saying. is something outside you made you unclean. Nothing outside a man can make a man unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean unclean. Now, the twelve, they changed the world. They evangelized the world. They stood before kings. They were martyred for their faith. They were bold as lions. And yet, it says right here, after he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. <laughs> it's good D time with Jesus. Are you so dull, he said. Really? We get so dull. We get so very dull spiritually. Yes, don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? This is a little talking Jesus right here. This is like the, the epitome of a talk with Jesus right here. For it, doesn't, for it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach. And then out of his body, in saying this, Jesus declared all food clean. He went on, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of a man's heart come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. <sighs> all these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. Feel pretty dirty right now, don't you? <laughs> well, so do I, because we all are. If you don't, I'm scared for you. See, no one has the scripture on straight. No one ever will. All we can do is keep getting polished more and more. And God just keeps giving it to us. But you know, it isn't what happens to us. We're so focused on what happened to us. See, it's what we make out of what happened to us that makes us unclean. We all remember the golden ticket from Carlos and Lucy's book. When you said this, I felt that. And I made, what I made out of it was this. Great godly-centered communication. What have you made out of the things people have said to you or done to you or not done for you? See, that's what makes you unclean. Not actually what they did. God ain't thinking nothing about what they did. When it comes to you, all he's thinking is what you did with it. This is where I'll share with you about me. So we went to L.A., right? My mom and I and got there. And, and, you know, we've been talking since the beginning of the year about where we might live and all of that. And uh, we've had many talks, many emails, many texts, more than I could ever count. And uh, every single one of them, without fail, was all about us going to Redondo Beach. Because you, you all know the situation, my son, and, and uh, he really, as we did the research on all the schools, really the only school, public school in LA, that can really handle his specific needs is Redondo Beach High School. So that's why we picked that. I really don't care where I live. I mean, I go to Watts, I can go anywhere. I don't really care. I used to cruise in Watts, so that's, that's cool. Go back there. And yet, when I got there, you know, Sunday, lesson was great. Woo, announce it, bro. Awesome. We love you at the love of the Lord, all that good stuff. And, and then uh, they had a great wedding. And, and then yeah, after the wedding, I had Tracy had, you know, sent me many, 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 many texts, all the places that she was wanting me to look at. So I had my list of places, and I got ready, and I, you know, as I walked out the door to go to the car, Corey's like, hey, what are you doing right now? Oh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to look at all these places. He goes, oh, great, that's going to be awesome. He says, well, you know, there's the, the, all the regions and the borders. Just make sure that you're like in Hawthorne, Lawndale, and, you know, anywhere in that area. Make sure you don't go down to like Manhattan Beach, Redondo Beach. What? You're kidding me, right? So my demeanor changes. So did the plans change? Mm, no. 
I'm confused. All these texts, these phone calls, these emails. Every one of them was about Redondo Beach. Now you're like, no, don't go to Redondo. Well, if you're outside the region if you go to Redondo Beach. That's, that's South region. You're in, my, you're in my region. I don't care about no borders. Now I'm, mm, I'm playing the accusation game. Angry. Ticked off because I have fear about my son, right? And so he goes, hey, man, bro, well, have a good time. We'll talk later. The next thing you know, you know how it works. Then Nick Bordieri calls me. <laughs> hey, bro, how you doing? <laughs> All right, Shepard. I got you. <laughs> hey, man. He's, you know, so I share with him. Oh, well, hey, man. Well, that's, that's just an oversight, bro. I'm sorry about that. Hey, man, that didn't appease me. Still angry. You know, then Tuesday comes, and uh, we have staff meeting. Kip's preaching, he's talking, he starts talking about this growing sense of entitlement with some of the leaders, like, like they deserve to be appointed, and they deserve this, and they deserve that, and, and he says, and even some are entitled about where they live. <laughs> Just looks at me. I was like, all right, it's on now. <laughs> We're done. Mm -mm. We go to lunch, take my jacket off, but all right, let's talk. You know, it was really funny. At the end of the day, I was like, then after the lesson, Nick and, Nick and Corey come, hey, what did you think about that lesson? Yeah, I got the half a point for me. I got it. Yeah. And they're like, well, just, just share your heart, bro. When you, when you get with the kid, just share your heart. And oh, I'm going to share my heart. Don't worry about that. <laughs> and you know, they're like, well, what do you get? Well, he's either going to put me in another region. He's either going to take me out of ministry. Or he's going to change the borders. They go, oh, good luck with that. I go, okay, that's the one I'm going to pick then. Because that's how we get, right, when we're angry? We pick our paths, and it's the one of most conflict when we're upset, right? So we get together, and, and we're talking, and, you know, I share my heart with Kip at lunch. And, and it's an amazing thing. He's way ahead of me. He says, uh, well, bro, you know what I think we need to do? I think we just need to change the border of the region to go down to Redondo Beach and... You know, so your son can be taken care of and all that, and, and uh, that'll be great. And I go, okay, well, that's great, because I already drew it out for you. Here's where the borders need to be. <laughs> we get so audacious, don't we? And we get angry. We get upset. And, of course, what was the lesson on in South Central on Sunday? It was just entitled, Anger. <laughs> so I had my opportunity for a righteous life. And I failed the test for about 24 hours. And then Wednesday comes. I still haven't looked for a place. And we're getting ready for midweek. Now, I know midweek is a follow-up on Sunday. Corey does it like that. And it's about anger. It's a more practical application of anger. So they're teaching us how to, how to put into practice all these scriptures so you don't get angry, right? So my, car, my mom's car breaks down. So I walk down to the auto parts store and uh, go in and I buy one of those little portable jumper things that she can carry in the car because it kept going dead. And so I walk out of the store and I'm walking out and, hey, what? You gonna, you gonna pay for that? I just did. And it's a lady. She's like all harsh. I said, I just did. She's like, yeah, right, show me the receipt. I was like, I had half a mind to just start running. <laughs> I, I was like, I was really considering. I was like, I'm going to make, I was like, you did not just, you just, just talk to me like that. Customer. It's my validation for why I'm angry. So I gave her the receipt. She looks at it. And she's like studying it like it's a book or something. She's like. Yeah, whatever. And she walks away. Oh, dude. Mm. Remember white chicks? No, he didn't. <laughs> I'm about to get nasty in this place, man. I'm in South Central. 
But we try and find outlets for our anger instead of going to God. You know, then we get to service, and everybody's in the circle, right? And Corey's standing there, and I was like, I want to mess with him. So I'm like, because I'm not going to God yet. So you got to figure out something to do with your time instead of going to God. So he's sitting there, and I see his, his phone sticking up out of his pocket. So I, I go up to one of the brothers, I go, and I, I'm in the South Central, i got to practice. <laughs> hey, what's up, Corey? I give him his phone back. He don't trust me anymore, but... So it happens when you blow it, when you get angry, you know, you, you just, even your joking around becomes something that can hurt people. And yet, I had my next opportunity to make a righteous choice, the righteous life that God desired from me. And all I could say to her is, you could have been a lot nicer about that. And I walked away with invites in my wallet, you know, because we all blow it. But you know, I realized something. You have to be looking down upon the person that you remain angry with and think you're better than them to keep your anger. We've got to implore Ephesians 29. Hold our mouth to what's helpful for building others up. I blow it, you blow it at times. We've all just got to get a deep conviction about blowing it a whole lot less. Thank God we're in the kingdom because we have to forgive each other. <laughs> How bad is this when we let our, our heart get there? Go back to James. We'll close out. How bad is it when we don't commit ourselves to God-centered communication because there's an evil desire that's taken over in our heart? Our last point is don't let Satan trick you into deceiving yourself. Verse 26, if anyone considers himself religious, that would be anyone who wants to follow God, right? I used to try, you know, I was a truck driver, I was a drag car racer, jock, and I used to try and be the disciple that wasn't religious. I hated Christian music, I hated the whole gospel music, and I, I tried to be this disciple that wasn't religious. And yet you just can't do that. You are religious. And so he says here, if anyone considers himself religious and does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our fathers accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. You know, it was life-changing for me on this trip because, you know, I saw several people baptized and I saw a widow be baptized with her young child off to the side. And I saw... Young widows being taken care of. I saw kids who grew up who never knew their dad. Now that happens everywhere, but it's really concentrated where we're going. And God was really preparing me that I need, really got a, a tight rein on my tongue, my anger, my self-centeredness that causes that. Because I've got to look after orphans and widows. You know, there was two guys that I met, and they were orphans that became disciples. But here, he says you do this to keep yourself from being polluted by the world. You know, he talks in this chapter about the moral filth. Moral filth is, it's like that dirty, nasty, brown earwax you get in there. You know, it's, it's ah. This makes you spiritually deaf. You can't hear the word of God. He says, you've got to get rid of all that moral filth in your life. Get some Q-tips. Spiritually clean your ears out so you can hear the word of God. Stop focusing on what happened to you and who did it and who said it and all of that. Let's get back to true religion. Orphans, single parents, no Oprah, no court TV, you know. Today... 
James isn't saying theoretically we should do these things. He's saying just do it. Be a doer in God's kingdom. Be a doer of the righteous decisions and actions that come from being a disciple of Jesus. Today, don't let the trials go over your head. Don't play the accusation blame game. Commit yourself to godly, God-centered communication with each other and with others, especially those who are lost. And don't let, don't let Satan trick you into deceiving yourself by not removing the moral filth that gets into our hearts. What's the charge today? See the opportunities for righteousness and take them. Then, you and I as God's first fruits will get those good and perfect gifts from above. And we can have an experience here on earth like we will have in heaven. I love you all very much. Look forward to next week. Have an awesome day.